Day 3 at Indo-Pacific 2022 here in Australia. Today we're covering weapon systems, mine warfare and a bunch of other naval defense technologies. Rheinmetall of Germany has this impressive moving display of the Millennium Gun. It's a closing weapon system, 35 millimeter. It can target air targets with the airburst ammunition as well as surface targets, so it's actually multi-role. Company representative told us it's the first time that they're showcasing it uh, in this variant with a fire control radar and an electro-optical system fitted at the back of the turret to increase uh, the accuracy and that way the turret doesn't depend on the sensors fitted on board the ship. The Millennium Gun is uh, currently in use with uh, the Danish Navy on board the Absalon class uh, ships, the Indonesian Navy with the PKR frigate by Diamond as well as the Navy of uh, Venezuela. Another big moving display here on the Rheinmetall booth is the mass decoy launching system. It is a trainable launcher. Uh, they are showing it with the Kanto anti-torpedo decoy by Naval Group. Uh, the system is currently being evaluated by the Royal Australian Navy. What they are showing as well are two sensors that can be integrated with the mass decoy launching system in order to automate the defense of the ship. Uh, at the front there is a laser warning system by Saab and behind me a radar electronic support measure, radar ESM, uh, to detect uh, radar emission from incoming anti-ship missile, again in order to automate the launching of decoys by the mass system. On display right here is one of the ammunition available for mass, and I was told it is quite unique because it combines both shaft and infrared decoys. Last but not least, Rheinmetall is also showcasing sea mines. Those are produced by the Italian branch of Rheinmetall. The Murena can be triggered by three modes, acoustic, magnetic and pressure. The Asteria is a much newer sea mine and can also be triggered by optical and electrical means. There's currently a requirement here in Australia called C2000 for such sea mines. We are now on the Lockheed Martin booth to discuss Lorasm with uh, James Heading, business development at uh, Lockheed Martin Australia Missiles and Fire Control. James, good morning. Thanks for having us. Morning, Xavier. Good to be here. So what's the latest with Lorasm here in Australia? Latest with Lorasm, uh, currently under contract under Air 3023, Maritime Strike Program, uh, bringing uh, Lorasm onto the Super Hornet. And uh, just uh, to remind everyone, that's not a full-scale model, that's a half-scale model half -scale of Lorazem. Yes, it is. A big full-scale here would take up a lot of space. So with this uh, contract you just mentioned, what's, uh, what's the aim of uh, that integration uh, contract? So the aim of the integration is to get it integrated onto the F-18 Super Hornet as soon as possible. Um, so we're already under contract for the integration and test. It was announced a couple of months ago back in the US. And also obviously under production now for Lorazem as well, the Lot 4-5 contract, which was awarded earlier last year. Can you remind us how many uh, F-18 Super Hornet does the uh, Royal Australian Air Force has and uh, how many Lorazem uh, is Australia acquiring, if, if you may say? Sure, yeah, well F-18s in, in country is a combination of the F-18F, so just the F model they have here as well as the Growler stuff, so 24 aircraft and stuff in total. Um, at the moment on Lorazem, congressional notification was given on Lorazem uh, a while ago now for up to 200, 200 missiles and any other comments really on uh, total numbers, we'll leave that to Defence to talk to. That sounds like a, a lot, so uh, I guess Australia is getting uh, really geared up for anti-ship uh, strike mi missions. Uh, can you remind us uh, what Lorazem is exactly, what, what makes it unique anti-ship missiles compared to other missiles out there? Sure thing. Well, Lorazem is part of the family of AGM-158. So we started off with JASM, so the Joint Air to Surface Standoff Missile, which has been in inventory with Australia now for quite some years. Cleared off the Classic Hornet at the time. We then got onto the AG-158B, the JASM extended range, and then through to Lorazm. So there's a genealogy there. We've continued the AG-158 family of weapons to develop yeah, the long-range uh, anti-ship missile. Right. 
Lockheed Martin is also displaying a vertical launch system fitted with LORASM, so that's a quarter scale. Is this a topic here in Australia as well, vertical launch LORASM? Yeah, it certainly is. There's a program there at the moment, C-1300, Maritime Strike Program. What Defence is looking for is an anti-ship capability on both Anzac, Hobart and Hunter class ships. And we would like to think that LORASM is a very good contender for that capability. So how do you launch LORASM vertically? Like I, I see a, a pretty large booster in your model. It is. Uh, where is this booster from? It is. It's a very large booster. To keep things simple, we chose a booster that's already qualified and cleared in the vertical launch system right now. So the Mark 114 booster, people may be familiar with that under the ASROC, so the, uh, the, the rocket launch torpedo effectively. Uh, so reuse that to simplify some of the test evaluation which was done back in uh, sort of 2017 with some of our last firings. We did a proof of concept using a ship in the desert concept to launch LORASM out of vertical launch systems, but also out of a canister launch as well, so on board deck. So both configurations are quite possible. And uh, will this fit on board an Anzac class frigate? Yes. You need the uh, strike length silos? Yeah, you, you need some extra length in here. I guess the unique part for us in the booster itself, as I said, it's a current booster that's in production, but we've also then teamed with Talos Australia, an announcement we made last year, um, to actually look at building a, a unique booster for LORASM here in Australia. So getting a teaming agreement together with Talos, who are the contractor operating the government-owned facilities here in Australia. The booster will come from Australia, and uh, would there be future development regarding the booster? Yes, there would be, yeah. So obviously we'll start with the Mark 114, a tried and true capability. That'll get the initial capability here, and then develop in parallel the booster. And the idea with the, developing a booster here in Australia is not just to stick with Lorazm, but to develop other boosters, boosters to rocket motors, rocket motors to larger rocket motors, and even through to hypersonics in the future. A unique capability, really, for Australia, which goes back in and addresses some of the, the uh, glider weapons and explosive ordnance enterprise requirements right now. All right, James, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. And that was a brief look at uh, Lorazm News here in Australia. ECA Group is one of the contenders, three contenders for C-1905, which is a Royal Australian Navy requirement for mine warfare systems. We are now with the CEO of ECA Group, Mr. Dominique Gimnoni. Dominique, good morning. Good morning, Xavier. Thanks for welcoming us on your booth. Yeah, so can you please first tell us about your proposal for C-1905? Yes, Gavi. So C-1905 is a, a key project for us. We are here to uh, present to the Royal Australian Navy our capability. Our proposal is, is based on a fully integrated system for mine warfare, which includes autonomous underwater vehicles, unmanned surface vehicles and also unmanned aerial vehicles, all being fully integrated with our system called Umisoft. So it's a fully integrated toolbox, very efficient for the mine warfare and we believe it's a good fit for the Royal Australian Navy. Can you tell us more why do you think this is your solution is, is, is the best solution for the, the Australian need? Well, uh, ECA Group has been uh, uh, honored to be uh, selected by the Belgium and Dutch navies to develop uh, this uh, fully integrated solution. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, within NATO, uh, the Belgium Na and Dutch Navy are, are leading the way on the mine warfare. So um, with this program, we are really a step forward from the competition. And um, with um, the mindset of being um, very operationally efficient and also open, we believe this solution, open to partnership and to the Australian industry, is a good fit for C1905. So you said your solution is open. Does it mean you can integrate existing systems currently in use by the, the Australian Navy, such as like their UUV or existing AUVs? Yes, we can. Uh, actually, we are doing it already for the Belgian Dutch Navy, where uh, we integrated an aerial unmanned uh, vessel from, uh, from another company. Uh, and by the way, this is also the case here. They are using another one uh, that we will be able to integrate. But the integration is not only limited to this kind of drones. We're looking forward to integrating as well some uh, signal processing tools that the Australian uh, industry or in university have developed. Uh, Dominique, you're showing that the command and control module can fit in a container. Does that mean that your offer can be containerized and used from shore? Yes, um, the, basically from the start, from the design phase of our solution, we um, incorporated this requirement for our solution to be deployed from shore, from a craft of opportunity or from a dedicated vessel. So our solution can be containerized as well as integrated into a dedicated ship. 
And uh, last but not least, Dominic, what's the, the time frame? Uh, when uh, can we expect a decision on C1905 by the, the Australian government? Yeah, we're expecting the RFT anytime soon. Um, Rumor says it's, it's going to be out before the end of, of May with a decision um, towards the end of the year starting maybe Q1 2023. So it's very soon and we are eagerly waiting to, to compete and, uh, in, in this bid. Very well, thank you very much. Thanks, you, Xavier. The other contenders for C1905 are Thales and a consortium composed of Saab, Lidos, Atlas Electronics and Seabyte. We are now on the L3 Aris boat, which is showcasing uh, this very interesting model of uh, undersea warfare. We are with uh, Scott Elson, Technology Director here in Australia. So Scott, good morning, thanks for welcoming us. Thank you, Xavier. So what are you demonstrating here with this uh, very interesting model? Uh, there's a lot going on. There are seabed sensors. I recognize an ara class OPV, Hunter-class frigate, a lot of unmanned systems even a Tegos and a Collins class submarine. So what are you showing here? Thank you. you know, we're showing a number of the technologies that we're currently uh, operating or looking to operate in Australia. And we're trying to put it together into an entire undersea surveillance type system, somewhat positioning for uh, the Australia's future interest in projects like 5012, which is an integrated undersea surveillance system. I'll start with on the left hand side here, we've actually got a number of underwater fixed ranges. We've got both sh uh, shallow, um, shore and deep water ranges. These systems can be used for cooperative tracking, test and evaluation, or could also be used for surveillance type activities, uh, ranging water depths up to 4,000 4, plus metres, or could be done as, as shallow as only 50 to 100 metres. We also do a number of our portable ranges. Uh, it's a, a, a technology we currently have deployed with the Australian Navy and in the United States. The portable ranges are deployed either on the seabed or on the surface and allow us to test and evaluate torpedoes or other underwater vehicles such as AUVs in a, in a co cooperative environment. We also have uh, a unique capability in Australia of our underwater uh, communication system. True, originally it was called Hail, it's now called Mask. It allows our underwater systems to communicate in a network and allow them to be able, be able to talk to each other in a common solution. So we can go from seabed to surface to shore and provide the joint headquarters information of what's happening undersea at all times. We have that incorporated into things like the Collins class submarine, which we have here in the middle, and representing a towed array and an IVA, which is uh, deployed from the front of the submarine. Another technology we're showcasing is our underwater power technology. This is intended to be laid forward deployed. Uh, it's, it has batteries that allows an, a, an AUV to actually dock and recharge itself. Also, supplying communications to that, we can actually allow the devices to stay under there and command them to be released or, or move ahead. Coming back to the Arafura class, there's a, we're currently involved in a number of the, the build of that with Lurson in Australia. Um, but we're also looking at what the future payloads might be for that for MCM and hydro, including uh, hydrographic autonomous vessels, off-board um, autonomous uh, surface vessels, or even um, AUVs. And that, that's going to be a program of record, as you said, for Northern Australia? Yes, yes. So the, the 5012 is intended to look at ways of instrumenting uh, our northern parts of Australia to protect and, and provide some surveillance. Mind you, I've, I've been talking a lot about the underwater sensors, but we'll come back to the ship sensors, such as you said, the Tagos and the large uh, unmanned surface vessel. We also have a small plane in the back here, which is part of the Peregrine program, which is a surveillance craft. And we have shore-based sensors as well that allow us to look over above the water. And uh, the, the final part of the puzzle, which is actually hard to see here, is that we also have provide the communication systems above water to, to network this above water and below. Very well. well thank you very much for these uh, in-depth explanations of, of the display. So this was L3 Aris of, uh, at Indo-Pacific 2022.